All right, well, would you please open your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 as we continue our verse-by-verse study through Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. The title of our message this morning is called Selfless. Selfless. A man visited Detroit a while back and was so kind of amazed at the city and its history and what, was, what it looked like today, he decided he was going to take a walk. And he was kind of advised not to walk in a specific area, especially late at night. However, the curiosity got the best of him. And he really wanted to see what was going on there, so he dressed the way he normally dressed, and he walked in an area of Detroit that was not known for its, let's say, Christmas joy. At some point, a man came up to him and began to talk to him, but he he didn't want to stop, so he kept walking, and soon other men joined, and it was quite clear that these men had evil on their mind, and It wasn't long before they stopped him and they began to beat him and as he fell to the ground they continued to beat him they went through his pockets they took all of his money and they had beat him so many or so hard and so many times that he was unconscious and he laid on the ground now this was the middle of winter so it was also quite cold out he could do nothing for himself and he was just sort of laying there in a pool of his own blood left to die by this group of men who decided they were going to take his stuff from him. Now, maybe a half an hour passes by. There just happened to be a pastor of a large denominational church in the city who had walking in that direction. He saw the man, and as he looked, he, he, he quickly began to focus kind of back on his own path. He was across the street, and so he just saw it, he looked, and then he just kept on going. But maybe 20 minutes later, an elder of another church saw, he was walking on the street, and as soon as he saw the man and he saw his condition, he was laying there. It went through his mind that, I wonder if the guys who did this are still around. And he looked at the man's plight, he looked at him, and he kind of thought, you know what, he shouldn't have been in this part of the city anyway. This is kind of his own fault. He crossed the road, and then he walked on. Yet another 20 minutes passed, the man still hadn't got up, and he was probably going to die But another man who saw him, who in fact had grown up in that area, looked at him, had pity on him, and he went over and he began to clean him up. He saw his plight, he knew he was very cold, so he got some blankets, and he knew he couldn't just leave him on the street, and and for whatever reason decided that, you know, it wasn't good to call an ambulance, so he, he collected him up, he put him in his own car. He got blood all over the inside of the car, though, and he loaded him up in his own car, he took him to a... Um, a house where they were able to take care of him. It was like a bed and breakfast, but they were able to sort of nurse him back to health. He had no insurance. He wasn't going to take him to the hospital. So he took him to this place, and then he paid for his week's stay along with food and groceries and then made sure that if the bill went higher than that, that it would go back on his credit card. He left his credit card there for them to continue to charge. And he went on his way. And the man never woke up and he never saw him do this. He just, a week later, he came back and was fixed up and went back to his home. Which of the three people who saw him showed him the love of Christ? I think the obvious answer is that the man who sacrificed his own resources, vehicle, and time, and money to make sure that he was taken care of. Now, this is a fictitious story, but it's not even my story. This is a story that Jesus told to a lawyer who came to him and said, what must I do to get into heaven? Believing that he had already done all the things that he needed to do following the law. And Jesus said, love everybody. Basically was his answer to him. Love everybody. And this happened to be somewhat of a wealthy man. And he he addressed his issues with his idols, which we kind of did last week. But the story, all I did was change it from Jericho to Detroit and updated some of the things so that we would have a vivid picture of what it is that Jesus was trying to convey to this man. 
Jesus came into this world and did the greatest act, in fact, gave the greatest gift that the world could never get for itself, and it is this salvation. It is the way to heaven. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to heaven except through me. It is that sacrifice that he made that made it possible for us to be saved. Notice, God did not do this for himself. He did it for the benefit of those whom he loved. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He loved and he gave. The Apostle Paul, in the last several chapters, has been trying to speak to our personal mindset that says, look after me, take care of number one before all others. The, the Christians in Corinth had a lot of knowledge of the scriptures. They knew what they could legally do and still be a Christian, right, and still, still be considered a churchgoer. They, they knew what they were allowed to do. They could eat meat sacrificed to idols, but what they were mostly thinking about was what was good for them and what they could do, not what was good for other people. And see, Paul was trying to give them another set of lenses by which to view life. Paul was saying, okay, listen, starting with Christ, Christ did this for us because he loved us. Now, once we receive that love and that forgiveness, Christ wants us to turn and rather have that same set of lenses for the people around us. So life isn't really about how it affects me, what it does for me, or really living a selfish lifestyle. It's about living a selfless lifestyle for the benefit of other people, ultimately leading to, hopefully, their salvation. This is, this, is the, this is the filter by which all of Paul's decisions were made. This is how he decided what he would do in life. And this is what he's been speaking to us over the last several chapters over and over and over and over again. And, and, and just like a good teacher, he's going to summarize all of his points and he's going to bring it all into focus this week. But first I want to speak to our own selfish nature. Did you know that we're all started off in life as me specialists? Right? In the beginning... When you were hungry, you cried. When you were angry, you cried. When you were happy, you smiled and laughed and cooed, right? And, and this same mindset carried all the way through to your adulthood. When, when we're unhappy, we do certain things, and when we're selfish, we're unhappy. When we think of ourselves, we're unhappy. Forbes magazine ran an article in which they titled it, The 10 Traits of Unhappy People. I want to share them with you this morning. Number one is that unhappy people are always looking for future stuff to change. That there's always an event in the future that's going to change life. So they're unhappy about where they are. They're hoping it'll change in the future. That's number one. Number two, unhappy people spend too much time trying to acquire things. Unhappy people tend to be self-isolationists. They don't like people. They're unhappy with people, so they're only happy with themselves, but they're actually unhappy, so they isolate themselves. Number four, unhappy people tend to have a victim mentality. They think the world's out to get them, and they see every situation uh, as further evidence uh, that there's some sort of conspiracy out to make them unhappy. Unhappy people tend to be pessimists. They never see how things could be good. They're, not, they're glass half empty kind of folks. Um, number six, uh, unhappy people tend to be complainers. They complain a lot about what's going on around them. Unhappy people tend to blow things out of proportion. Unhappy people tend to ignore their problems. Unhappy people don't tend to improve on themselves. And unhappy people look around at the people around them and they do this thing we call keeping up with the Joneses. Selfish people are unhappy people. Unhappy people become selfish people. It's a vicious cycle that there may be even people here today that are caught up in. You're thinking about yourself right now, right? And I can prove to you, I can show you how selfish we all are. I can take a picture of you right now and post it on the back wall. Who's the first person you look for? Right? First question you'd ask, did he get my good side? Right? Me specialist. This is why we have to be told to think about others. This is why we have to come out of our shell. We have to get our eyes off of ourselves onto Christ for the benefit of other people. And this is what Paul is really going to talk to us about this morning. Picking up in verse 23 of chapter 10, book of 1 Corinthians. Let's look at this thing together. Paul writes, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each other 
uh, each one the other's well-being. So this is, this is the principle now that he's laid down. This is really the summary uh, principle that he's been trying to explain to us over and over again using different sort of illustrations along the way. He says, all things are lawful for me. Now, we, we've kind of covered this part. Now, this, this phrase, all things are lawful for me, was like, this was like the, the Corinthian Christian anthem. Right? These were people who knew that, that you know, they didn't have to follow the laws of Moses. They didn't have to follow the ceremonies of the Jews. They could come to Jesus for salvation. And really, all things are lawful. Right? And, and, and for them, that phrase meant that you know, I can do a lot and still be a Christian. I, I, it doesn't, you know, the Jews say, you don't wash your hands a certain way. You're not a, you know, well, I don't have to do those things. I am a Christian. I love Jesus Christ. He loves me. He died for me. He saved me. And I'm going to heaven. This was all things were lawful for them mentality. And this carried over because in their area, what was a really big deal was eating meat sacrificed to idols. There was a lot of idol temples in Corinth. They worshiped uh, their own idols. They sacrificed animals to them. And then they ate the meat. And some of it was sold in the market. So the Christian uh, question that was being asked of the day is, should we be eating this meat that was sacrificed to an idol? And Paul's response was, why not? As long as you're not worshiping the idol, and that's what he spoke to us about last week, as long as you're not worshiping the idol, as long as you're not partaking in these idol worship things, I mean, don't, don't, don't go completely off to that side. You know, don't, don't partake in these ceremonies. He says, but as long as you're not doing that, listen, it's just a ham sandwich, man. You know, it's just a slice of bacon. If I could teach the world to have happiness, it would be to hand a slice of bacon to every person. Remember that Coke commercial where it was a hand of Coke and I was just like, man, you really sell yourself short here. Bacon would make everybody friends. Why do I always derail on bacon? I don't know how this happens, but... All things are lawful for me. This was on every Corinthian Christian refrigerator. But Paul says that and then he adds to it. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. I need you to understand this. All things may be lawful for you, but not all things are helpful. Then he repeats it again. All things are lawful for me. And then he adds to it again, but not all things edify. And then he brings it back into this principle. He says, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Corinthian Christian or Punta Gorda Christian, this is what needs to guide your decisions in life. Don't look for what's right for you, what's legal for you, and what's good for you, but rather look what is good for the people around you and for those who you have relationships with and those whom you hope to bring to Christ. This is what Paul is going to repeat over and over and over again to us this morning. He says now, he's going to use this other illustration. He says in verse 25, eat whatever is sold in the market, asking no questions for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. He says, okay, now listen, when you go to buy your meat and you go to your local Walmart and they got everything and all the meats together, now you have to understand, in these open air markets that they had in these days, I mean, they did have their, I mean, it's just like today. You had your Publix, you know, that sold the, 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 the good stuff, you know, but they also charged for the good stuff, right? And then you had your, your, your other meat markets that were there. But, but within these meat markets, though, some of the things had been sacrificed to idols. Remember, when they sacrificed these meat to idols, you know, they ended up with a lot of pork chops left over, right? Now, you didn't eat all the food, all the meat. You know, if you sacrifice an ox for one family, well, I mean, how much of that ox are you going to eat? And it's going to go bad if you don't do something with it, so let's make some profit. Let's put it out in the market and let's sell it. That was the idea. And, and so in the market, you, had, you didn't have it sectioned. It wasn't like they had an idol worship meat section and a non-idol worship meat section like today. They didn't have gluten-free and, you know, gluten, gluten plus or something, whatever they had. I don't think they have that, but... Gluten's and everything, by the way. We didn't even know that, but my wife's got an issue. She got, she's gluten-free and dairy-free. Makes it impossible to get pizza nowadays. But I tell you what, uh, we have made some good pizza with other stuff. You can make cauliflower crusts. It seems like blasphemy, but I'm learning from Paul that we can do other stuff outside of ourselves. So, and if you put bacon on it, it's good anyway. So, I mean, it's... Here I am again. All right. So Paul is literally saying, hey, when you go out, don't eat it. Or so don't ask, rather. Don't, don't ask what you're eating. He says, it doesn't matter where it came from. The demon doesn't inhabit the meat. You can eat the meat, whether it was sacrificed. And then he quotes here Psalm 24, 1, where he says, for the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. In other words, he says, that cow belonged to God when it was on the hoof, and it belongs to God when it's on the barbecue. Everything in between, you're fine. As long as you're not taking part in these idol worship and ceremonies, you're good. Now he goes on, and he, and he brings us into another context. Verse 27 says, if any any of those who do not believe invite you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you asking no question for conscience sake. 
Now, I mean, this is, I love when Paul brings this up because this is such a great point for us to know. He says, listen, if a non-believer invites you to their home for dinner, don't go in there and start asking questions about where the food came from, all right? Don't expect a non-believer to act like a Christian, by the way. I think this is good for all of us to know. You know, it, it, Paul doesn't prohibit interacting with people who are non-Christians. And I know, and you know, I, I, I've been a Christian for a long time. I know that it's, it's, it's fun because you have a fellowship, you invite your Christian friends over, you guys have dinner, and you've got lots of stuff to share. We, we love to do small group stuff. But listen, we also have to look outside of ourselves, and we want people to get saved. And the best way to do that, to build relationships, is having a meal with someone. You know, we like to invite people to our home. We love to have that kind of fellowship with people. We love doing these kinds of things, you know. But it, Paul didn't say, listen, you, don't be of the world, but you're still going to be in the world. If you're going to reach the world, you've got to be in a relationship with the world, and that's the difference, right? And so he says, listen, if you do that, that's one thing. Make your feel, make your do. But listen, if a non-believer invites you over, knowing you're a Christian, and makes you some pork chops, don't worry about where it came from. Don't worry about it. The relationship and their salvation is far more important than where that meat came from. Do we get, uh, we're kind of getting this, right? Because he's going to pound it over and over and over again. He's going to use these different illustrations, but, it, but he's always arriving to this. Other people, their salvation and their needs is more important. But he does bring this back into a Christian perspective where he says, okay, but if anybody says to you this meat was offered to idols, don't eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord and all its fullness. He says, conscious, I say, not your own, but that of the other. So Paul's literally saying here, okay, look, if somebody comes up to you and they say, oh, hey, by the way, that meat was sacrificed to idol. And this, this infers that this would be a Christian person who has a conscience, a moral objection to eating that particular meat because it was sacrificed to an idol. What is Paul saying? He says, well, if they've got an issue with it... now." First of all, you're like, well, where do you get all that? Well, well first of all, a non-believer would have zero issue with where meat came from, as long as it was good and not going to make them sick, right? So this is a Christian coming who's got an issue with it. He says, okay, now shift it. They kind of ruin the meal for you, but for their conscience sake, don't, don't automatically offend them if you know it's a conscience issue. If they've got a, you know, a, a real, if they're having a really hard time with this, you know, maybe it's not the time to start laying out the scriptures and showing them where they're wrong. Just put the meat aside. Don't eat it. Notice again, he's saying, do what's best for them. Not for you, do what's best for them. Because this would be an opportunity to turn to them and say, hey man, it's legal for me, nothing wrong with it. Bible didn't say I can't do it. You know, if you don't like it, that's your problem. No, that's a selfish attitude. That's a selfish attitude. Think about them, think about their needs. So he says to you, once again, verse 29, he says, for why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of the food which I gave thanks? In other words, he says, hey, listen, there's a distinction that needs to be made here. Uh, I'm not so worried about offending someone's legalism as I am about offending somebody in the faith. Okay, let me, let me help all of us understand um, what that is. I got invited to a church one time. They were, they were hoping we were going to be joined together. Uh, in a particular ministry that they, that it, it was really more their ministry than ours, but, but they were hoping we'd partner with them, and, um, and we did. We ended up partnering with them. It was, it was more or less a financial thing we kind of gave to the ministry. It was kind of a good thing. Um, but I, I think they really wanted to sell me on it, and they really wanted to, to share about it with me. And so I said, yeah, that's wonderful. So they invited me to their church for lunch. And I mean, I'm excited about that. I'd love to make relationships with other churches. And so I went in, and... Um, I, I, that day, I had also had a couple of other things going on, and for those of you who don't know, I like to skateboard. I have a longboard. Uh, long it's, it's like I call it a sidewalk surfer. You might see me around town. Sometimes people stop me and say, aren't you a little old to be riding a skateboard? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm old to fall, but I can still ride the skateboard, you know? I'm all good. So anyway, I, I rode my skateboard to this church, right? And I got there, and I got my backpack on, and, and I got there, and the person that opened the door quite didn't expect the pastor to show up on a skateboard. And, and I could tell this. And, and I didn't feel nearly as awkward about that interaction as I did about the next one because when the pastor came out to greet me, he was wearing like a full suit. And I was like, oh, I didn't get the memo on this dress code. Like, I'm, I'm, now I'm feeling awkward. I come in with my skateboard, I'm looking for somewhere to put it, and I'm like, I don't know what to do with this thing, so I set it on the floor kind of by me, and we're sitting there, and we're talking, and a couple of minutes goes by, and I'm, I'm realizing the guy to my right is like staring lasers at me. 
and I'm not really picking up on why, and finally I'm, I, I, you know, I'm trying to think, is there anything I'm doing wrong? And then all of a sudden I had a flashback to second grade when my teacher came over and ripped my hat off my head, and I was like, oh, I'm inside a building, that's right. Somewhere along the line we decided it was disrespectful to wear a hat, so I took it off. Right? And then later on, they were giving me a tour of the church, and I didn't realize what was happening, but as I was walking around, I had a little cup of water, and I was carrying it around, and I decided to go over and look at the window, so I set it down on this little table, and the guy swooped up and grabbed the cup like that, and then followed me over, and he was standing right behind me, and I turned around, it was like that scene in the movies where, like, Lurch is standing there, I'm like, whoa, cool, awesome, I'll take my cup, and then, then it dawned on me, I'd set it down on what they believed to be an altar, right? So what was happening here? So that really this, this thing can go one of two ways, right? I could be like, look, I'm a pastor of a church. Am I not holy enough to be in your place? You know, can I, I, what I actually thought, what went through my head was about, you know, hey, can I get a list of these rules that you guys have so that I don't continue to step on your toes here? You know, I don't follow these rules, but if you do, then I want to. But immediately I was thinking to myself, I'm like, wait a second. They've invited me to their church. They have a set of rules. They have a set of things that they do. I'm in their place, and if I want to have a relationship with them, I'm going to find these things out. Now, it seems ridiculous, doesn't it? But I could sit there and demand my rights, and I could go on a tangent about what the Scripture says and doesn't say about wearing hats in a church or sitting down. You know, Jesus wasn't crucified on this altar, man. You don't have to get all upset. But, but what would that have done? What would that have done for the long run? Right? Their conscience, even though it's weak, perhaps, could be defiled and I could have ruined a relationship by simply standing on my high horse or getting up on my soapbox about what's right and what's wrong. And they might look at me the same way, right? Who is this uncircumcised Gentile coming into our church and making, you know, making a mockery? And, you know, they could have looked at me that same way, but I, I hope that the relationship did stay intact. We have continued to have some kind of a relationship. But the point is this, in every situation, don't we simply have the option to go one, down one of two roads? I can, I can say what's legal for me, what's best for me, what's good for me, and hey, if you got a problem with it, that's your issue. Or I can get outside of myself and I can say what's best for them. I can, I can leave these things over here and say what difference does it make if I take off my hat, carry my cup, next time I'll show up perhaps not with shorts, t-shirt, a hat, and a skateboard, if I'm coming to their place. I don't know if I'm holy enough to wear the suit to show up because I only do that twice a year, but, but you get what I'm going for. It's about their stuff, it's about their needs, it's about what they need. Now, this doesn't mean you have to constantly walk trying not to offend someone's legalism. Jesus, Jesus seemed to go out of his way to step on toes when it came to legalism. When the Pharisees had a huge issue with him walking across the field, he was picking grain. I had to, you know, you read that story, and it says the disciples were picking grain. They were eating it on the Sabbath, which was a huge no-no according to Jewish tradition. I had to sit there and I had to think to myself, it's not like Jesus wasn't aware he was being watched. He knew he was being watched. That's one thing. But for the brethren, for the friends, for, the, for those especially non-believers, don't make an issue out of secondary things if it's going to hurt the relationship and hinder the ability to build the kingdom. This is what Paul has been trying to get us to understand. Our, our, our baby minds that don't want to share our toys and want to scream and cry when things don't go our way, he says, set that aside, put your eyes on Christ, and focus on the needs of other people. That's a great message for Christmas, isn't it? So now, skipping down to verse 31, he says, therefore... This is, this is a culmination. This is, this is all of it. He says, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Once again, I seek the prophet, I seek to please them, I seek to do what is going to, I try not to offend the Jews, I try not to offend the Greeks, the Gentiles, or any other culture I'm a part of. I do my best to remove offenses, to remove barriers, to relationship for their prophet, and that they may be saved. This was the filter by which Paul made all of his decisions in life. And the Corinthian Christians were like, well, I can still eat meat and still be a Christian. I can still do these, I can still smoke, I can still drink, I can, I can, how much can I get away with and still be saved? That was kind of their mindset. Paul's like, no, don't think about that. Think about others, think about how to reach them. Okay, so how does this apply to ourself? 
How do, how do we leave here with a set of guidelines? And first, I, I want to just share. What, what I'm about to share with you is called an acronym called HELP. Okay, it actually comes from this text. You'll see how, how it kind of comes from this text right here. But it's an acronym called HELP. Is it helpful? Does it edify? Is it loving? And is it profitable? And what I want to do is go through these things one by one so that we understand exactly what they mean. But I also want to make you understand or help you to understand that these are no more than lines on the road. You know what I'm talking about? You stay, you, you, when you're on a lane on the road, you've got a fog line on the right, you've got a yellow line on your left. If you cross the white line, you go off the road, you go in the ditch. If you cross the yellow line, you go into oncoming traffic. These lines will keep you going on the road. They'll keep you between the lines. They don't necessarily always tell you where to go, but they'll keep you from crashing in the ditch. This is what this is. This is what this is, okay? Help. When you're trying to decide what you're going to do in life or how to interact or something is right and wrong for you, ask yourself this question. Number one, is it helpful? Listen to what Paul says. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. And you gotta get, if, you, if you got the old King Jimmy version, it says all things are expedient. And it, all, what this all comes down to is that there's a word that is translated and it's defined this way. It says to bear or to bring together to bear or to bring together. Should I be doing this? Ask yourself, does it bring people together? John 16, seven, this is where we find this word. Jesus says, I tell you the truth that it will be more beneficial for you or helpful for you that I go away, he said, because the Holy Spirit is gonna be coming and he's gonna do all things. He's gonna fill the church, he's gonna power you, he's gonna, he's gonna do a whole lot more than I'm doing in this ministry. In fact, he says, you guys are gonna do greater things than I in scope, right? That's where we find this word. It is more beneficial, it's more helpful. It will bring you together. So number one, is it helpful? Does it build up? Or rather, is it helpful for bringing people together, causing me to reach more people with the gospel, or will it hinder that? Number two, does it edify? Edify. The word edify means to build up or to add strength. To build up or to add strength. We find this word somewhere else, and this is where it's really defined. It says here in verse... Uh, or rather, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 11. It says, And he himself, speaking of God, gave some to be apostles, prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, and listen, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to be a perfect man, to be the measure of stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Paul is talking about we have these evangelists and we have these teachers and pastors. We have these things for what? For building up the body for the work of the ministry, he says, but really for, for, for the edification of all. We go through the word each Sunday. We go verse by verse. This is to build up the church. Hopefully, if you've been coming for, here for an amount of time, you say, yes, I am growing here. I grow through hearing the word of God, right? This is what it means to edify. So when you make your decisions in life, you can simply ask yourself, does this edify? Will it build me up or somebody else? The third thing you can say is loving. Under the acronym HELP, is it helpful? Does it edify? And is it loving? You say, where do you see loving here? Well, it's not necessarily written, but it's written all throughout the paragraph. It is loving to give no offense either to Jews or Greeks or to the church of God. It is loving to look out for the interests of others. And by the way, this is written all throughout the New Testament and even the Old Testament. Philippians 2.4 says, let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but for the interests of others. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 says, See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Psalm 119.36 said, Incline my heart to your testimonies, Lord, and not for selfish gain. In other words, to look for other people. This love is written throughout all of the scriptures. And in fact, Jesus summarizes it for us in one, or actually two verses in one place in the Gospel of John. John 13, uh, 13 or 34 and 35. John 13, verse 34, 35. Jesus says this, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And he says, he has this qualifier to it, though, just in case we run off with our own definition here. He says, as I've loved you, so you love one another. And then he goes on to say, he says, by this, all will know that you're my disciples. In other words, this is the criteria for the world to judge whether or not a church is actually Christian or not. It is their love for one another. Now, this word love is used in different ways 
throughout the scriptures. There are several different Greek words that describe the word love. In English, we have one word for love, and we use it for everything. I love tacos, I love my wife, I love my mom, and I love my dog, right? All of them different. In Greek, it's much more descriptive. There's a word love that's used here. It is a word called agapeo or agape love. It is the same type of love that Jesus showed on the cross, dying for the benefit of us to, to, to forgive us for our sins. This is the love that he's calling us to live. It's a love that has to be shown in order to be known. Because really, there are only two types of people in this world. Pay attention to this one because this is good. There are two types of people in this world. There are those who love others and they're willing to make sacrifices for them. And there are those who love themselves and are willing to sacrifice others to get what they need or want. There are those who love others and are willing to make sacrifices for them and those who love themselves and are willing to make sacrifices, uh, sacrifice others for the things that they want. You know anybody like that? You ever met someone like that? This is not the mindset we are called to have and those people are unhappy. <laughs> they are extremely unhappy. You wanna be happy, you want the blessing of God, you want the joy of the Lord in your life, learn to serve others. So is it helpful, does it edify, is it loving, and is it profitable? P is profitable, to collect or to contribute. This is what Paul says at the end. He says, give no offense either to the Jews or the Greeks or the church of God, just as I also please all men and all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Matthew 5, 29, Jesus is talking about sin. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, it is more profitable for you to enter the kingdom of heaven minus one eye than to go to hell with your whole body. You see, it benefits. So all of these kind of say the same thing in different ways. Is it helpful, does it edify, is it loving, and is it profitable? Now, I say all these things, and, and I just reminded you at the beginning, these are like the lines on the road. This is a, a helpful guideline that will keep, keep you from crashing in the ditch or running into oncoming traffic. Right. This is helpful for keeping you on the lane on the road, but, but I wanna make sure that you understand that, that these things begin and they end with Christ, okay? If I just simply left you with these tips for how to have happiness in life, and I leave Christ out, you may leave here thinking, well, all I have to do is follow these things and I'll be a much better person, right? That's not what this is about. No, 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 this isn't about being a better person. This is about loving Christ. You see, when you raised your hand and your sins were forgiven, that was because Jesus loved you and was willing to make that penalty and that sacrifice for your benefit. Once you realize that and then you build that relationship with him through the reading of your own scriptures, when you sit down, you have your own devotion time and your own prayer time and you're you know, rubbing up against and having fellowship with other Christians and, and you're navigating this way through, the Lord wants to take that mindset that he had for you and give it to you and have you have that mindset for others. What's good for them? But it begins with your relationship with Christ and it continues to be powered by your relationship with Christ. It begins and it ends with Christ. If your eyes are on anything else, this is a good, this is a good sermon for a Sunday, but it won't be on there on Monday. This is a life mindset. It's not about being a better person. It's not about being a person at all. In fact, Galatians 2.20 sums it up this way. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, so it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He says, this life that I now live on in the flesh, I live by the Son of God who loves me and dies for me. I live by his power for his purpose. And through that, I can use this acronym. Is it helpful? Does it edify? Is it loving? And is it profitable? That is how we become more selfless, and I believe Every time we hear this, it's a good thing. We need to continue to hear this, lest we go back into our selfish flesh. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, once again for this day and this message, Lord, and the time we can all come together, Lord, on Sundays to hear it. Lord, there are times I'm, I know that even when we read the scriptures, Lord, it's tempting to be like, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know. And you know we know but it's repeated throughout, so often throughout the scriptures because we need to continue to hear it. Probably by the time we're sick of hearing is about the time we start getting it. Lord, today I do pray that this is a, a, a mind shift for all of us, Lord, especially as we get into this Christian uh, or Christmas season as we, we, we're looking to others, Lord, for their benefit. Let, let's not seek our own, what we may get, but Lord, let us be givers. Let us be gracious givers. 
Let's look for what's better for others. And let's, let's, let's look outside of ourselves. Give us the courage, Lord. Give us the ability. Bless us, Lord, with your joy and your mercy as we set forth today. And Father, I just pray for those who may be here, Lord, who have not yet given their life to you. They've been invited. They, they, they came. But Lord, today you want to change their lives, and we know that, so I pray for them now. So while your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, I just have a question. If you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus. You heard all about this, and, and, and you, you know about church and stuff like that, but, but you've never really raised your hand and said, I want to become a Christian. I want my sins to be forgiven. Today's your day. You see, because I want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you, and he brought you to his house today to share with you this message. That he knows you, he loves you, he knows how many hairs are on your head, he also knows everything you've ever done. And he likes you. And he's offering you this opportunity right now to be forgiven for all of your sins. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God, that's you, that's me, that's everybody in here. But Jesus stands ready and willing to forgive those things. And all you have to do is to raise your hand, and when you do that, this is basically, it's called repentance. It's recognizing that you're a sinner, and you want your sins forgiven, and Jesus is ready to do that, and then come into your heart and change your life. All you have to do is raise your hand and receive it. God bless you. I see your hand in the back. Is there anybody else? I, you just must know that Jesus won't turn anybody away. This is so important. There's nothing you've ever done that's so bad, so wrong, that Jesus can't forgive you. Is there anybody else? I'd like to do it right now. God bless you. I see your hand also. We don't want to move on without you, man. This is such a huge, huge deal. Awesome. For those of you who raised your hand, just pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord, I come before you today and I acknowledge that I am a sinner. Lord, I know that I've not lived my life the way you'd have me live it. But today, Lord, I'm asking you, Jesus, to forgive me. Today, Jesus, I'm asking you into my heart. I pray, Lord, that you will come in and you will change my life, that you will fill me with joy, that you will guide me in my decisions forevermore. Today, Jesus, I want to become a Christian. Now, to those who prayed that prayer, raised your hand for the very first time, say, welcome to church, welcome to the kingdom, congratulations. Today, you are a Christian in church. If the angels are rejoicing in heaven, then so should we. 